This retro tea break is supported by Fusion Gaming Magazine, a brand new magazine covering all types of gaming. It includes insights from industry veterans and articles from familiar names, like this guy. Oh, that looks good. The magazine fuses retro with modern, indie, and even tabletop gaming, perfect for your own retro tea break and impressing the kids with your up-to-date gaming knowledge. Visit fusionretrobooks.com to subscribe or click the link in the video description. Our guest today is likely responsible for the careers of many in the computer industry. He gave us the ability to create games on our Atari STs and Amigas with the simplicity of BASIC through his STOS and AMOS products. And he hopes to do it all over again with the return of AMOS. Yes, AMOS 2 is coming, people. So let's find out a little bit more about the man behind it. It's Francois Lionet. Welcome, sir. Hello, Neil. Nice to be here. Francois, we'll, um, we'll learn about Amos 2 a little later today, but let's go way back, first of all, to Stoss. When did you first have the idea of making something like Stoss? Uh, it was in uh, uh, '86. Uh, I was working at the time with a, develop a, a French game creation group that was called Jorks, and the logo was a uh, shark. Uh, so I should have been uh, careful by looking at the logo. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, uh, at one time they, they came on this uh, idea that actually made sense at the time. Uh, it was to replace uh, Gem on the Atari ST by what was popular on PC at the time, which is a, a DOS-based system with a black uh, command line interface. And personally, I didn't uh, like uh, GEM. You know, it was clumsy. And uh, when you wanted to use it in low res, you only have like four or five icons on, uh, on the which, uh, which was ridiculous. They did not even redo the interface to cope with the uh, different resolutions. So it was, I hated it. I, I'm say <laughs> and uh so yeah why not uh so uh, dos on the pc uh at, at the time it was really popular you had the command line and you also had associated with it the basic language which was um q basic i think at that time and uh, so uh, we were two on the project there was uh, one uh, greek guy a very greek you know, with a thick accent, and uh, we ate good food and uh, had good time at his place. Uh, but very Greek and very macho. <laughs> it was so cool. Uh, Constantin Sotiropoulos, and that's why his name is on the product. Um, so he was in charge of making the DOS command line. Uh, he did it, uh, and I uh, was in charge of making the basic. Well, I, I chose to be in charge. And uh, as I uh, was making games up to then, uh, and on different platforms, you know, uh, the first thing you do on a platform, uh, arriving on a platform is to display graphics and sprites. So you need a sprite engine to play music. You have to have a music engine and blah, blah. So why not put that uh, for me first, uh, once for all to be used later, uh, whenever. Yeah. And you'd worked on games before you mentioned, and those games included uh, Captain Blood was a well-known game that you worked on, wasn't it? Yes, uh, I just did the adaptation of uh, Captain Blood. I'm not the author. The author is Didier Bouchon and Philippe Lerich. Uh, but, but I had the chance of working with them, and they are real, real geniuses. Uh, you know, you, uh, Didier Bouchon is a fantastic creative programmer, but with a creativity that overflows from him all, all the time. And uh, so I did the Commodore 64 and IBM PC CGA uh, versions. Yeah, so you had experience in working on lots of different platforms. Yes, that's the alien hand interface. In yeah. Blood. <laughs> so the idea of STOS was to make the ST more accessible to us than it was um, so that we could create games or, or better games with the simplicity of BASIC. But how did you get to know the Atari ST well enough to create all of those low-level functions we could then <laughs> by, not, by not opening the, the dock at all <laughs> <laughs> because i always have hated docs and you know never always program in machine language up to 93 with click and play and uh, eve my partner had to spend hours on the phone to exp well 
uh, me calling him 20 times a day so that I finally understood what pointers were. Uh, so, uh, so at the time, I hated docs. So I just bought one book uh, from a famous French publisher that was called uh, Micro Application, the Bible of the Atari ST, and just uh, look at the addresses where the screen is so that I can poke in it. And actually, <laughs> uh, the whole system, you know, it's not multitask. So you basically, it's a uh, null design. You can do what you want. So when you start stars, it's bye-bye system. I take the, I, I spot the end of the system and the rest is mine. <laughs> <laughs> and to get the mouse coordinate, I just couldn't find it anywhere. So I just used a sniffer, moved the mouse and located the, the places in memory where, where I changed. <laughs> so <laughs> that's to explain why the, with the new version of the system, it doesn't work. So it has to have a new version because it changes. So yeah, I'm kind of a brutal programmer at the time. <laughs> break it see what happens and if it's a good thing do it again basically <laughs> yeah um you published us through europress uh, it was europress wasn't it that you published uh, at through? first it was called mandarin software oh mandarin yes in fact yes. and the I've and the mother yes mandarin, mandarin software yes. <laughs> the, the mother company was europress because uh, uh, europress was very big in england at the time it was a very big publisher of uh, Computer Magazine. I, th I think when uh, we started Stoss, uh, they were publishing half of all the English ma computer-related magazines in England. So it was like 100 person, et cetera, in, uh, uh, near, in Stockford near Manchester. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And was it a good seller for you, Stoss? Did it do well? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it was my, uh, my first... Well, uh, the, I had two big sellers. Uh, the first one was Driver, my first game. That actually paid for a whole summer of skydiving. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> and then, and then Stoss, yes. yes uh, and, uh, you know, it was a fair royalty rate because English companies are good to work with. You know, they respect people. And that's what it's called. I had 15% and that's a normal royalty rate. So, yeah. yeah. A driver. That was was that the game on the Oric One driver? Yes, yes, yes. Was that a popular system in France then? Because I yeah, the, no, it really wasn't yeah. over here. Yeah, yeah, and that that still uh, surprises me. You know, uh, I don't understand why because it was a good machine and uh, you know, uh, physically it was really steady, and much much better than the Spectrum. You know, and with the soft key of the Spectrum, the the Oric didn't have real keys, but they were you know stuff. Uh, and the, uh, the Atmos uh, after that is a brilliant machine with a fantastic keyboard. I, I never understood why, never. But uh, Because also it's an English machine, so we, we, there's no question of uh, it's a French machine, we're going to bash the French and, and not uh, buy a French machine. <laughs> I know you. I know how you are, in, you English. <laughs> <laughs> you know us too well. <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. <laughs> I love the French bashing. Uh, there's no more. There's no more anymore these days uh, that I know of. But when I uh, each time I came to Europe, there was a French bashing about this or about that. It was uh, so fun. I uh, I lived in Paris for a year, Francois. So I I had to get used. I had to grow a thick skin. <laughs> <laughs> um, Francois, after Stoss, you decided to treat us Amiga users to Amos. Um, but writing Amos wasn't a straightforward task for you because in the French you have national service. And I believe Amos was created while you were on your national service. Yes. And uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, actually, I started uh, to program Amos uh, right when I went to classes in Libourne, uh, which is a wonderful town near Bordeaux in the middle of the wine yard. Uh, so as, an, uh, I, I, uh, as I had studied uh, as a vet, uh, I pushed it as much as I could and until I could not anymore. Uh, so as an officer, uh, during the classes, I could live outside of the caserne. Uh, so yeah, I arrived there with my uh, Renault 4, Renault 4 uh, full of uh, Amigas and screens. And uh, the landlord lady could not believe her eyes and was so afraid that I would blow everything. <laughs> And then after the, uh, yeah, so I didn't work at all. And uh, I was, you know, the kind of person to be uh, two kilometers when they are, when the real military person are uh, running in the front. So I was in the back walking. <laughs> so I was last. You were in the back. <laughs> Thinking about I was programming. second last, second last, <laughs> second last. So someone managed to do worse than I, to do worse than I. And that was, it, it was okay because the last town was actually my hometown. 
So I just went and lived one year at, uh, at my mother's. <laughs> that was really fantastic. <laughs> so I'm going to put you on the spot now, Francois. Amos or Stoss, which was better? Stoss was... Uh... Well, Stoss, I did the stupid choice of uh, putting line numbers. That was definitely a stupid cho- st- thing to do. But also, you know, when you work on a device that is oriented toward the past, uh, somehow you program like it was done before. So, uh, and at the time, uh, you know, there was uh, most base basi- basic were uh, having um, line numbers. So it was a stupid mistake and I was looking backward. Uh, so I, Amos is, is on this side. It's a better pro product, uh, and it's a better multiplied by better because the machine is better as well. So it's a much better product on its own. But uh, on the product itself, and apart from the line numbers, it's it's about the same. It's a, yeah, a lot of code has been, uh, and but it was the first version. So of course you rework on the routine, you make them better. You of course. And of course, there were a slew of upgrade packs for both Amos, Amos and Stoss. Yes. And um, I used to work, of all things, I used to work in a dinosaur museum. And I remember all of the displays in the museum ran programs written in Amos. Wow, that's um, so cool. Yeah, yeah, which was really cool. Um, but I knew they were written in Amos because I could identify the mouse cursor and, and, <laughs> and the fonts. You, know, yeah. you could change these things, but, you know, a lot of people would use the default cursor and, you know, yes. the go-to fonts, and you could tell it was an Amos product. That is really cool. Given that, do you think it was acceptable to take a game written in Amos to a publisher, or do you think there was some snobbery in the industry if you didn't bleed assembly language when you wrote your games? Yes, uh, there was definitely a uh, snobbery because, you know, when you bring a game to, uh, to a publisher, it's evaluated by the programmers and the programmers, they defend that work. So if someone comes with something that's made with a tool that enables people to make the same thing in uh, 10 times less time, they are not really happy somehow. <laughs> but uh, also, uh, you know, Stoss and, uh, and Amos were uh, tools used also by beginners. And as it allowed allows them to make things that somehow worked, you know, and be published. There was uh, like an aura of uh, crap, crappitivity, can I say that, uh, associated with the name uh, Amos, you know, oh, it's an Amos program, it's crap, I've seen this one, and you, uh, of course, because it was made by a 10-year-old, but, uh, yeah. so, you, but it could be used for prototyping. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I know that Flight of the Amazon Queen, which was a commercial game, was yes. prototyped in Amos. I think it was and, actually uh, rewritten in C but when it was released, but it was pract- it was completed in Amos. Yeah. And uh, so there are, there are some rumors, uh, and I, I don't know if they are actually true, that uh, Worms, the prototype was made in uh, Amos and then yes. in uh, Blitz or something like that. Yes, because that was part of an Amiga format magazine competition, yeah. I think. It was an entry, yeah. so maybe that was sent in, in in Amos. I'll have to look that one up and find out, yeah. Um, but then Amos and Stoss stopped. We had no more releases. Why didn't we see an IBM PC MOS or any more versions? Because of the squirrel, that was the logo of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it was a kind. It was not a scam. You know, there were good guys, but they. Uh, the, it was a group of author where we share everything. So we only sign a single paper. Okay, we. I. We claim we are. We are author. We have thirty percent of the cost, and we do the marketing as well. And you, the programmer, you get seventy percent. That is so cool for the programmer. So okay, it was okay when they were doing some work. Oh, uh, you know, doing some uh, uh, coming with the ideas because all the game up to Stoss were uh, their ideas. Uh, they did the graphics, they managed with the music, etc. So it was okay. But you know, after Stoss and Amos, uh, they did the perfect. They did their wonderful job to go to England with uh, the original Amos that, you know, was uh, with the DOS, so got rid of the DOS, etc., uh, and focus it on uh, game creation. 
that's the key. So the, if there was, if there would not have been there, there would be no Amos. Uh, Amos. Oh, I'm back again. <laughs> <laughs> Amos. Amos. <laughs> there would would not you uh, Amos would have died. Uh, but at the end, uh, you know, I was doing all the job. Uh, I'm the author. You know, there were testers testing the instruction. Maybe some instruction they gave me the the name or the idea, but that's all. And I was still claiming 30%. So you know, I had no, no other choice. So I asked them to reduce to 15% and uh, slam. <laughs> so okay. So I contacted uh, the best, uh, you know. Uh, lawyer on, on royalties in Paris uh, uh, and actually I haven't won or lo lost money because the cost of him was the cost of uh, all Amos Pro and Easy Amos royalties but you know uh, I'm so happy I've done it because today I can make Amos too. You can yeah and we'll get yeah. onto that very quickly because just to fill in the gap then between that period and now you produced click and play so that took a whole new approach that was a more visual style of programming wasn't it yes it was and uh, I, in fact i had no choice because uh, as there was a legal uh, case uh, running at the time uh, and i wanted to do game engine because it's really cool for me i love that uh, and move to the pc i had it had not to be a language so, uh, you know, made my thought about uh, how could it be simple and yet, you know, real programming. That's the key. It has to be still, even if it's visual, real programming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, despite being uh, entirely mouse-driven, mouse it, it, it was still a complex system. It did just still take time to, to figure out how to use click and play and then realize the complexity of it and the potential well, uh, of it. You could do a lot with it. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, because a game is complex, you know, I always say that uh, making a game is the most difficult thing to do on a computer because not only it has to be good looking, it has to be fun. So this is not, uh, this is also the job of the, it has to be at the, in the frame. It, and also it deals with every aspect deep into the machine, you know, all the graphics, all the sounds, it's, it, it, it really scratches uh, low, low in the surface. So when you do a game, and it's, when it's a good game, it's a sign that you are a really good programmer. And uh, making game engine is really cool as well for me because I know every aspect of the machines. Uh, I know everything about the machines today. They have no secret for me. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot more besides to learn about Click and Play, about Amos, about Stoss. And in fact, we recorded a Retro Island Diskettes episode with Francois, which is our long format podcast. So we talk for oh, nearly two hours, Francois, about your life and we learn an awful lot about him. So I'll put links in the description where you can go and hear a lot more about Francois's story. But let's get up to the present day and uh, the return of Amos with Amos 2. Give us the hard sell, Francois. Sell it to us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Amos 2, uh, rediscover the joy of programming. Basically, that's it. You know, uh, uh, since five or six years, I receive letters. You know, you know, Amos was a product that I forgot because of the low case, because of my depression and everything, and somehow because of the rejections that I faced, had to face. You know, by uh, professional programmers saying it's crap, or it's made in Amos, you can ah, this kind of thing. So it really hurted me. You know, but I'm out of it. And since five or six years, I, I began to receive letters of people thanking me for, you know, with the renewal of uh, retro computing, you know, somehow at 15, it seems to shake a bit the memory cells in the brain. But before, no, you know, when the, cod, when the kids are gone, you have time to look at, uh, to go in the cellar and look at the old machine and make them work again. I think it's about that. Uh, so, yeah, and... Uh, all the letters saying I learned to program uh, uh, with TOS or AMOS. Thank you. Uh, I owe you my career in IT. And what a career. You know, many of uh, the, the, these people are very high in IT, uh, including uh, creating game studio with 100 people, uh, doing conferences all over the world and this kind of things. So, whoa. Uh, so I went, and then I went to Amiga 30 UK, uh, expecting to be mocked uh, as usual, uh, Amos, blah, 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 etc., these kind of things. And no, 
No, not at all. Even if no one listened to what I said on stage because I was too French, uh, whereas all the others were having nice uh, tea cup conversation on the sofa and everyone was laughing, but me, I was you know, doing the clown on the stage and no one was laughing. <laughs> so that was a bit frustrating. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I had uh, like a uh, love bombing there, and it was so, and uh, it matured. And uh, when I moved to Poland uh, after a bit of difficult period, I started the Patreon, and uh, just to put me to it, you know, to force me to it. Otherwise, I would still be, oh yeah, I'm gonna do it. But as soon as there is money associated, I mean, it's kind of a moral contract, Patreon. So, uh, and little by little, the. Uh, the engine also uh, started again in my mind, and, and now I'm working. Uh, this week, I've got an average of 13 hours per day, <laughs> and I'm happy about it. That's good. I'm glad you're happy about it. And what systems will we, will we be able to write our programs for and compile them? Uh, all. All systems. Uh, yeah, I'm using modern uh, technology, so uh, it, it's a transpiler, so it's not a compiler, but it's better to call it a compiler. It, it takes an, a, as entry uh, a name of program, original, out of the ADF, uh, and converts uh, what's in the program, the source code, the banks with the image, the music, the trackers, tracks, the data banks, etc., into modern a modern folder uh, properly organized with the source code in ASCII, etc., and uh, you can use uh, editors like uh, Visual Studio Code, which I love, uh, and then you compile, and what you get uh, as an output is uh, uh, an HTML uh, project that can run locally, so you don't even need uh, to be connected to internet to run it. You can drag and drop the index.html direct, even for Google Fonts, uh, because uh, that's an achievement I uh, made yesterday. Uh, you can uh, embed uh, the Google Fonts right into the application, so you can have now really nice fonts offline, totally offline. And once you have an HTML uh, kind of website, it's a website, in fact, uh, you can uh, embed it into whatever you want for uh, any machine because uh, with uh, technologies like Node.js and Electron. So uh, basically, uh, you can say uh, you will be able to port all your old Amos program or make new ones for iOS, uh, Android, uh, PC, Mac, Linux. Uh, and, the com and the compiler is also written in JavaScript and Node.js, so it runs on, uh, on everything as well. And I will certainly, you know, in the Orthon, uh, put uh, an online version of it, so you'll be able to code online, compile online, and uh, download the compiled application. Uh, and I will certainly be using the system I worked uh, on in Norway uh, two years ago, Friend, which is a virtual computer, and opened the very first virt community virtual global machine. That's going to be cool. Fantastic. Well, we'll put links to all of this information down below in the show notes. Um, how far along are you with the development of Amos 2? Do you have a, a release date in mind? Oh, yeah, yeah, everything is planned. So uh, I'm kind of confident now that uh, I will have a beta version in September, so uh, maybe on the 30th of September, but it will be September. And the release date of the electronic version is uh, scheduled for beginning of November. Uh, and then, uh, in the meantime, I will uh, manage to create a boxed version, you know, with a thick manual, so I still have to work on the financing, but uh, I think I shouldn't have no problems now. If you want to help, you know the Patreon. Uh, the <laughs> so the it is going to be a, a big box like the Amos Pro box with the uh, new graphics, of course, and a uh, manual uh, partly rewritten. Eventually, I'm in contact with Jason Darby, who is uh, worked with uh, with me on on Amos and Click and Play. And he's a great guy. So a real English speaker and writer. Uh, and this box uh, will be released during uh, an Amos party in Warsaw in, uh, for, at the end of December. So it will be the ideal Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> You're selling it really well. <laughs> 
Well, I wish you all the best of luck with development of that. Um, on behalf of myself, because I bought and enjoyed Amos back in the day, and anyone else who enjoyed Amos or Stoss or Click and Play or any of your other products, thank you very much for the work that you've done. If you're um, thinking that you used Amos back in the day and you didn't buy it, maybe you pirated, now would be the perfect time to go over to Patreon and support Amos too. I think you're uh, morally obliged to. <laughs> but you know, I, I really do, do, do not mind. Uh, I'm, I also have pirated stuff in my life, so let's let's be cool about that. It's, it's just it's just a question of uh, for yourself. It's not for me. It's for yourself. You know, do you can you live with it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much for your time today, Francois. Well, thank you, Neil. Thank you very much for the interview. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.